right, chapter 9, Civilizations in Eastern Europe, Byzantium, and the Orthodox Europe. The first several slides are going to be maps. I would highly make sure that you go back over the PowerPoint and the chapter resources on my website. And uh, go ahead and make sure you have an understanding of the maps with the boundaries of the Byzantine Empire, the split between the uh, West and the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, uh, and the areas that were bordering the Byzantine Empire, the trade routes, uh, the city of Constantinople and where it is located as far as trade goes, um, and areas that they're going to lose to uh, the Arabs and Muslims. The Baltic region, Slavic states, Kiev and Rus, uh, have an understanding of these locations, the expansion of Europe going northward. Uh, the Byzantine Empire and the spread of civilization in Eastern Europe will be the areas that we're covering. Uh, the Byzantine Empire, the origins of the empire. Um, under um, Diocletian, you're going to get a split between the west and the east, so the Roman Empire will be uh, split. You'll have two capitals, Rome, Constantinople. Uh, eventually, Emperor Constantine will uh, become your emperor in the 4th century CE, and he will found Constantinople. He will rebuild the city. Uh, this is when you're going to get your building projects with your churches uh, and your uh, palaces. Um, and Greek will be the official language from the 6th century on in the East, so you're going to already start to see a split between Latin and the Greek language. Uh, Justinian's achievements. Uh, Justinian uh, will try and reconquer the Roman Empire. He wants to reunite it because the West is pretty much in its uh, final decline and pretty much its collapse. And he's wanting to uh, add those lands back into the empire. Uh, which he originally starts to succeed at, but then areas are too difficult to hold. It's too hard with his military to hold these regions on the borders with the barbarians, especially your Germanic tribes and Slavic regions. And so um, some of those attempts start to fail and ultimately will be his downfall. Uh, he will have uh, some building projects, the Hagia Sophia, the large church with the uh, largest dome in the world at that time period will be built. Uh, he will have legal codification. He will unite all the Roman laws uh, into one set of common laws uh, to where there's a better understanding, a better unification, a better flow of the laws so you know what to expect in the court systems. Uh, Arab pressure and the empire defenses. Eventually, like I said, they're going to have a hard time holding their borders as the Arabs push into North Africa and they push into some of the uh, Asia Minor areas up at the north and are threatening their border areas. Uh, Byzantine society and politics, the emperor resembles Chinese rulers uh, and so does the rest of their uh, bureaucracy and politics as well. You kind of have that divine essence where God has appointed them, kind of the son of heaven. They're not, uh, they're not gods themselves but appointed by God. So you have a commonality there. Your bureaucracy, very similar as far as it being sophisticated, the multiple levels, the amount of people, uh, schooling for it, examinations for it, uh, and being open to all classes as well as another similarity. Uh, economic control, regulations of food prices and trade, this is going to resemble merchants in China where merchants were a little bit lower, they're gonna be a little bit lower here as well, even though they might get more wealthy, uh, and they're involved a little bit more in the economics than they are in China, you're still having the fact that the government's controlling it, so they don't really have a lot of uh, social status involved because of their job. And so they're a little bit lower as well, so another comparative issue. Uh, the trade network, you're going to have contacts with Asia, Russia, Scandinavia, Europe, and Africa. So again, our trade networks are continuing to expand as more civilizations are continuing to be uh, reached. The arts, creativity, and architecture, mosaics, and icons. So we're going to continue with our arches, we're going to continue with our large domes, and you're going to get their own unique style of art in their mosaics, and especially in their icons, which were paintings of saints and uh, angels and God uh, and Christ. And in the background, a lot of them are going to have a blue and gold background to represent the brilliance of heaven. The split between the Eastern and Western Christians is going to start to emerge. Uh, one of those beginning with the language, uh, as we saw under Justinian uh, and Constantine, you have 
the uh, Latin language in the West and Greek in the Orthodox area. And what you're going to end up having is Catholics in the West, Orthodox in the East. Uh, and some of these are going to start as early as uh, Charlemagne claiming to be the Holy Roman Emperor. And so the Byzantine uh, Emperor is going to take offense to that because they believe they're the heirs with the Roman Empire since they were part of the split. And so claiming that was offensive. And so that starts to begin the split. Uh, right after that, you're going to have uh, the Patriarch Michael uh, make his um, comments about the sacraments and how they are uh, dealing with those. Um, you had the issue of icons first, then Charlemagne, um, then the sacraments, which was the communion, whether the bread was leaven or unleavened. And uh, they are both going to mutually excommunicate each other. So both uh, saying that you're no longer part of the church, and that's going to begin our official split. There'll be some other things down the road that we'll study in the next couple chapters as well that will kind of finalize that, that there's not going to be any kind of reuniting or healing process involved. The emperor's decline, the period of decline is from the 11th century on. So shortly after the split, you're going to get uh, the beginning of their decline and where they're going to start to lose some other lands with the Seljuk Turks. Uh, one of those was the uh, Manzikert defeat. And this was important because this takes a large part of Asia Minor uh, on the map here. Uh, I would make sure you have an understanding of where that is. But that part of Asia Minor included where they received most of their taxes and where they received most of their food. And so that's important to understand that they're losing a large source of money and a large source of food as well. And now they're within uh, a couple hundred miles of Constantinople. And so that's uh, pressure right there in itself, uh, the uh, Seljuk Turks being that close to their, um, their capital. Uh, Slavic states are also going to emerge to the north where they, uh, Byzantines have been expanding and missionaries have, be, uh, have been sent for the Orthodox Church and they were competing with the Catholics. And you're going to see some of these states start to emerge uh, as themselves and become independent and start to form their own uh, nation states. There's an appeal to the West uh, to help uh, with the Crusades, to help them defend against the uh, Arabs. Uh, that's ignored for a while and then eventually sent on uh, by Pope Urban II, and you'll read more about that again. The uh, Really the important crusade to note is the Fourth Crusade, and you'll see it again in a couple chapters, is uh, in 1204, what's going to happen is you're going to have the Venetian Crusades, and they're going to sack Constantinople, and this is where Venice merchants were competing with Constantinople merchants uh, for power in the Mediterranean. And ultimately, uh, Venice will end up winning, and that's going to help them secure a spot uh, later on that we'll continue to read where uh, Italy will emerge as a power in the Mediterranean. Uh, Constantinople will fall in 1453 to the Ottoman Turks, and that will officially end the Byzantine Empire in 1461 when they conquer the remaining uh, little pockets uh, that continued afterwards. The influence through conquest, conversions, and trade. Um, as I just said, uh, they'll have missionaries from the Orthodox Church that are going to go northward into the Baltic regions and even up into Kivu and Rus. And uh, Cyril and Methodius, Methodius were um, important missionaries that are going to go up. They're going to fail in the conversions. A lot of these areas are going to go uh, and convert with the Catholic missionaries. But one thing that was important is the Cyrillic script, which was their alphabet for the Slavic language, was developed by the Orthodox missionaries that went up to that region. Uh, the Eastern Central Borderlands, competitions from Catholics and Orthodox Greeks, uh, we're going to continue. Uh, the Catholics are going to gain areas with the, uh, the Czechs, the Hungary, Poland. Uh, so regional monarchies are going to start to prevail, so there's an influence from the West. Uh, and Jews from uh, Western Europe are going to flood into Poland, and it's going to have the highest concentration of Jews in that area. So a mixture of Orthodox Jews and Catholicism in this region. Uh, there's a Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox chart. I would look over that to make sure you have an understanding between the split and uh, each belief. The emergence of Kivian Rus, um, Slavs from Asia and uh, an influence from Scandinavia are going to uh, merge into this region. 
Uh, you'll have iron working, extended agriculture. Uh, they're going to mix with the early populations in this area, uh, which would have been family, tribes, and villages. You'll end up forming kingdoms, and the religion at the time was animistic, uh, the, the worship of the gods within nature, and of course, Orthodox Christianity and um, Catholicism coming to this area. Uh, sixth and seventh century, Scandinavian merchants in this area and trade between Byzantine and the north. The trade routes are going to run north and south versus what they run for the Middle East and the rest of Asia where they're running east and west. Uh, most of your trade will be more north and south and then what comes from the east will be from those eastern merchants coming into this area. Uh, 855, a uh, monarchy under Rurik, uh, and he was Scandinavian, and he is going to set up the center at Kiev, and that will be their uh, capital. Eventually, we'll see later on as Moscow, Moscow starts to emerge. Uh, Vladimir the First, 980 to 1015, is going to convert, convert to Orthodox. He doesn't like the idea of Catholic priests not being able to marry, and he doesn't like the idea of being under the Pope. And then Islam, he didn't like all of the uh, all of the restrictions on meat and all of the restrictions on alcohol. You have to remember he's Scandinavian, cold weather, alcohol warms the blood, according to what they thought. Um, and so uh, Vladimir is going to convert to Orthodox Christianity. Um, and so again, you'll have that Caesar or Papacism, where you're having one person over the church and the empire itself. Uh, institutions and culture in Kievan Rus, influenced by the Byzantine patterns, Orthodox influence. So you'll have ornate churches, you'll have icons, monasticism uh, with your monks and nuns. Uh, art, literature, dominated by religion and royalty. Um, and free farmers were predominant. So you'll, um, this is kind of going to be the emergence of serfs in Russia, which we'll read about later on. Um, but there are some freedoms with the farming uh, at this moment. Your boyars, which are your landlords, it's your aristocracy, uh, they were less powerful than in the West. Uh, your uh, Caesar Papacism, which was a czar, uh, was more in charge during that time period uh, than your aristocrats are going to be. Uh, the Kievan decline is going to decline around the, tw the 12th century. You're going to have rival governments and problems with succession for uh, for who's going to be in control. And then you're going to have Asian conquerors with the Mongols, and it's a group of Mongols called the Tartars. And they're going to come in and control that area by the 13th century. And um, you're going to have uh, traditional cultures going to survive, uh, but it disrupts some of the politics. And we'll see Russia reemerge politically a little bit later on. The end of an era in Eastern Europe, the Mongol invasions usher in a new period. East and West are further separated. Uh, and we'll continue to see that in the next couple chapters that we study on Western Europe. And that will conclude chapter.